Okay, welcome this evening to the second session for the Freezer Beef Boot Camp. Uh, we've got Dr. Greg Renfro on this evening, our meat science specialist. So he is a wonderful speaker and very knowledgeable on all the topics here. So uh, I do ask that you hold your questions until the end. Um, you can put them in the chat box or you can unmute at the end of the presentation and ask your questions then. Um, without further ado, Dr. Renfro, I'll let you take it from here. All right. Uh, I am live from my basement. Um, as Michelle and I were talking about earlier, the kind of the new normal, so to speak. But um, I have to warn you folks, this is my this is my third Zoom meeting today. Um, my one this morning was two and a half hours. I just got off of a faculty Senate meeting for that was two hours and 45 minutes. We may be done about 10, 15 minutes, if that's all right with everybody. But, um, <laughs> Let's go ahead and, you know, and, and I was able to, to log on last week for Dr. Van Valen's uh, uh, presentation, and she kind of focused on different production systems and, and uh, maximizing those production systems. So I thought, okay, let's take that virtual animal that she talked about on uh, last week, on last Monday night, and let's take that guy to the next step. So let's take this virtual animal this finished animal that she talked about, let's take it to the next step. But before we go any further, um, we're going to treat you kind of like students. So for the next few weeks, you're not only hearing from Dr. Van Valen and myself, but you're going to hear from uh, other specialists, Dr. Uh, Birdine, Dr. Halix, and so on. And so you might start hearing things a second and third time. And so we're going to treat you like we do our students. If we say something more than once, it's usually pretty important. So, for example, like tonight, we're going to go and we're going to talk about meat inspection tonight. And I know Dr. Birdine is going to hit on that as well. Now, I'm going to go into it deeper than he is. All right. And I'm going to hit on some of his stuff that he's going to talk about, but he's going to go into it deeper as well. So we're, we're kind of giving each other like commercials of what's going to happen. So just be aware that if you hear something for two or three times or several times, that's usually a pretty good indication that it's a it's an important thing that we're uh, that we're trying to get across. But regardless, now we're going to take this animal to the next step. We're here to do this freezer beef, this direct marketing type stuff. And one thing I wanted to challenge you to think about, because I know speakers down the line are going to say this as well is what are your goals, all right? Um, I get a lot of these phone calls from folks that are interested in doing this stuff, and I always ask them, what are your goals? And the very first thing they always say is make money, okay? Everybody that's in business is trying to make money, but what are your goals? Are you looking for a way to earn a little extra income for your farm? Are you looking to promote your farm? Are you, you know, what are you wanting to be? Are you going to be, you want to be the next Laura Freeman? You know, Laura's lean, okay? Those are things I want you to think about in the next uh, few weeks because we're starting to take you down this line where we feed, now we're going to go through the slaughter process, now we're going to go into the economics and the marketing and so on. So these are things I want you to think about. Insurance. The one really kind of neat thing is you're going to get some actual advice from somebody who is doing this right now. Uh, Dr. Halich does this, as, as the kids say nowadays, that's his side hustle. That's his hobby, okay? And so he's going to talk about some of the stuff that he is experiencing this, you know. So he's got this, you know, this kind of hobby that he does. I don't have any cool hobbies like that. I just lift weights and do mixed martial arts, so... But these are things that we're going to talk about as we go through there. So again, if you hear us say something twice, it's usually pretty important, all right? So first things first, again, we got to talk about some legal stuff, all right? And some of you have heard me say this before, and again, you've heard me say it uh, you know, several times, um, this meat inspection, all right? What's interesting is ever since I was a meat science student back in the uh, in the early 90s, I started cutting meat in the late 80s. Uh, I knew that the book The Jungle was what caused meat inspection. All right. 
I didn't realize until, I, as, as some of the kids will tell me, I was today years old when I found out that The Jungle was actually made into a movie. And it was in 2014, I looked it up. And if you notice down here, it says, a wonderful story of the beef packing industry. I find that really interesting because The Jungle was written by Upton Sinclair. And Upton Sinclair was a socialist. And his sole purpose of writing this book was trying to convince our country that we needed to be a socialist nation. Now, interestingly enough, he wrote this book back in 1903, 1904 was when it was published. And it's interesting that we still have these conversations going on today. Uh, one thing, I just kind of a side note, I, my, my students think this whole concept of, of border walls is a new thing. And I tell them, you know, about three years ago, I stood on top of a wall that had been there for almost 3,000 years in China designed to keep people out. So we don't, we just rehash old ideas, I guess is the best thing to, to go about it. But Upton Sinclair, writing this book, The Jungle, he was talking about trying to be a socialist society. However, the background for his book was the Chicago meatpacking industry. And what he was trying to do is show where the, the immigrant workers were and how they were treated. And so back then, the, the big employer for immigration workers was in the Chicago meats industry. And even though that book spawned meat inspection, it would basically birth the whole concept of food safety. Yeah, you know, whether he realizes it or not, he has often said that the Americans missed the point of the book. He said, I aim for their hearts and hit their stomach. And he was probably right on that from some standpoint, because a lot of people miss the whole concept of the book. They just focus on what was being uh, highlighted in there, what was going into their food. I don't know if any of you've read the, the, the book. There's a lot of stuff in there that talks about what went, our food, what went into our food. I don't know whether or not any of that was true, but there was enough interest that it forced uh, President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, not FDR, to send a, a special commission to Chicago to see what's going on. There was enough going on there that it forced Congress to pass the Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906. And basically what that did is it mandated that there be a federal meat inspector in present in every plant that's a processing meat intended for interstate commerce. That's the government's wonderful, beautiful way of saying inspected before sold. Okay? That's what they wanted to do is make sure everything was inspected before it was sold. There's no exceptions to this. I cannot begin to tell you how many people have told me well, I'm only doing two or three animals a year, so I don't need to be inspected. No, you have to be inspected. Well, so-and-so told me I didn't have to. No, you have to be inspected. Are you sure? Pretty sure, you know. Uh, so you have to be inspected. If you're going to sell meat, you're going to have to be inspected. And in reality, folks, you're going to want this product to be inspected, okay? Um, and the reason being is it's a little bit of a level of protection between if somebody gets hurt, somebody gets sick in yourself, okay? If somebody eats your product and they get sick, the first thing they're going to say is, was it inspected? If you say it was inspected, then we start investigating what's going on there. If you say it wasn't inspected, then all of a sudden that comes back on you and the processor that allowed you to sell that kind of stuff. So you do want that. I realize it's, it's a little bit more of a hassle and so on and so forth, but you do want this product to be inspected, okay? Okay. Now, I told you we were going to go into this a little bit deeper than what Dr. Burdine is going to mention when he talks to you. There actually are two forms of inspection, federal and state. If you are a federally inspected facility, you have a round inspection legend that usually has a number in there. It's like a social security number. It's called an establishment number. If you are a federally inspected facility, you can sell meat in all 50 states. So that product can be sold in any state that uh, in the union, all right? Now, foreign markets, that's a totally different ball game that goes beyond what we're gonna discuss tonight, okay? You can also be state inspected. Now, state inspection has to be equal to or better than federal inspection, 
But the kicker is it can only be sold within the said state. It normally has, if you're a state inspected facility, usually has the outline of the state indicated this is the state that it was inspected. And it also has that numbering system as well. Now, if you notice in our illustration there, we have a map and you got some blue states with stars in there. The stars are where the capitals are. But those blue states, those are states that have a state inspection program. And if you notice, there's one right there in the middle that we call home that does not have a state inspection program. We had one back in the 70s, but the budget acts kind of killed that. Um, reason why I bring that up, because I'm speaking to a group from Northern Kentucky, all right? And so some of you might go to a processor in Ohio. Some of you might go to a processor in Indiana. Those individuals might be Ohio State inspected or Indiana State inspected. If that's the case and you're looking to get into this freezer beef program, the selling at a farmer's market type stuff, you need to make sure if you're going across the river, so to speak, to have your animals processed, you need to make sure it's a federally inspected facility. If it's a state inspected facility, so let's say you cross the border into Ohio and you're having your, your animals processed at an, at an Ohio uh, inspected facility, they can't be sold in Kentucky, all right? Now, some of you are gonna ask, okay, if you're telling me this has to be equal to or better than federal inspection, then number one, why do we have a state inspection program, number one? And number two, why can't I, if I have it processed in an Indiana or an Ohio inspected facility, can I not sell it in Kentucky? And a lot of that goes back to this whole amenable species thing. Our tax dollars pay for inspection. Now, keep in mind, inspection and grading are two different things, all right? Inspection is under USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. Grading is under the USDA Ag Marketing Service. There's two separate entities. A meat inspector is not a grader and a grader is not a meat inspector. They're two separate people there, okay? And so we get into this whole concept of tax dollars pay for meat inspection. If we want it graded, we have to pay for it. Now, the good thing is here in Kentucky, we have a couple of uh, graders that work for the state that are USDA graders, so we don't have to pay for that kind of stuff. But the reason why I say that is our tax dollars pay for only a few of those individuals or for those individual animals to be inspected, all right? Your traditional livestock, cattle, pigs, sheep, poultry, goats, all right? Then we get into things like ostrich, emu, and stuff like that, but they don't pay for the inspection of things like bison, all right? And the reason why I say that is when I was in Missouri in grad school, their state inspection service recognized bison as an amenable species, whereas the USDA does not. And so that's part of the reason why you see that if, if a state inspection service like Missouri recognizes a species as amenable, then you don't have to pay for the inspection. Now, the USDA will inspect those non-amenable animals, but they're going to charge the processor who is in turn going to process, uh, charge you as well. So that's why we have that kind of stuff. So just beware, those of you in that area, if you're going across the river into Indiana or in Ohio to use a processor and they're inspected, make sure they're USDA inspected and not state inspected because if they are, that product cannot be sold in Kentucky, okay? Just kind of an FYI on that. Now, I told you we were gonna go into this a little bit more deeper than what you're gonna see and what I've kind of done in the past, all right? We've had situations in the past, and it was early on in my career, one of these examples I'm about to give you, where I got a phone call from a farmer. He was wanting to do what you're wanting to do. He said, how do I need to do this? I said, you need to find a USDA inspected facility. He found a USDA inspected facility. Then what ended up happening is he calls me up two or three months later and says he's in trouble with the USDA for selling non-inspected product. And I said, well, I thought you were using an inspected facility. He said, I am. 
turns out not all the areas of the plant were inspected. So he had two problems there. Number one, he didn't tell the processor he wanted the whole thing inspected because he was going to sell this at a farmer's market. So that was one problem. The other problem he had is he wasn't being very transparent with the processor. We'll talk about that later on. All right. But you need to make sure all areas are inspected. So there's some places that will have only the kill floor inspected to make sure that healthy animals are entering, entering in the food chain. Now, below these areas where we have inspection, you'll see these phrases, all right? And the reason why I have those phrases in there is because later on, I'm gonna teach you a little bit of the meat processor language. And sometimes you'll hear them, and I've heard them say this before, these little phrases under here, like beef, pork, and lamb slaughter, or raw, not ground, those are part of a food safety program we, ha we have called HACCP. And HACCP stands for hazard analysis and critical control points, all right? So they have to have HACCP programs in each of those areas in order to make sure that that product is safe and gonna, is gonna enter into the food chain and, and, and safely, all right? Now, can we guarantee that? No, absolutely not. And so the reason why I put that in there is because if you're one of those individuals that's gonna sell a farmer's market, okay? You have to have things inspected. So you're going to have to have the kill floor inspected. So your processor will have a beef asset plan for the kill floor. Then we'll go into the cutting room and it's going to go under a raw, not ground asset plan. All right. Then if you're going to sell ground beef, that has to go through a raw ground asset plan. And so you'll hear sometimes processors use that language. I've heard them say that to customers where the customer said, well, I need this inspected. And he says, well, I don't have a raw ground HACCP plant, so I can't do that. That's what he's talking about, all right? But you need to make sure that all these products if, that you're going to be making or selling, that you're having the processor make, go through the whole entire inspection program, all right? Not only do the, does the slaughtering of the animal have to be inspected, the cutting up of the animal, or the carcass, the grinding of those products. Even if you're gonna make processed meats, you can see we got, and I didn't even hit all the HACCP plans. So, you know, I've got here fully cooked, not shelf stable, summer sausage, smoked sausage, city ham, heat treated, not shelf stable, bacon, country style sausage, heat treated, shelf stable, different type of summer sausage. So we have all these in here. And so sometimes you will hear the inspectors say, or not, excuse me, it's here the processors say things like, okay, you need this, you need this to go through our raw, not ground plan. You know, okay. So just as you, you know what that, that lingo is. Now we're I'm gonna give you some other, you know, kind of survival meat processor ease, if you will, as we go through here. Okay, just just kind of FYI, because sometimes it's the spooky thing is trying to understand what the processor is saying there. All right. Other stuff, all right. Other stuff with the with the uh, meat inspector. Um we're not allowed to start processing that animal, meaning we're not allowed to slaughter that animal until the inspector sees that animal alive, all right? That's what we call the pre-mortem inspection, all right? He, he's doing several things there. Number one, he is making sure that we have a healthy animal, that the animal is ambulatory. Now, if you see down there further in the list, if he's not ambulatory, if he's a downer, all right, cannot walk on his own power, that animal cannot enter into the food chain. That's put in place because of BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, better known as mad cow disease. Those are the firewalls that are put in place to control that program or to control that pathogen. Um, does that mean that all downer animals have BSE? No, it's not. Okay, we've only had a couple in this country. It's just the firewall that we put in place. So he wants to make sure the animal is ambulatory. He's going to be looking for any outward signs of disease, all right? And if he sees anything that gets his attention, he's going to target that animal for further and closer inspection. Classic example of what you see, uh, if he sees an animal come in and he's looking like he's sick or he's got a runny nose or something like that, he's going to target that animal. And the reason being is just like in human beings, if they're sick, they probably probably been given an antibiotic, all right? 
And he's going to perform a few other tests on that. It's called the KISS test, kidney inhibition swab. He's going to check that for antibiotic residues because we cannot sell something that's got an antibiotic residue. So that's why it's extremely important if you do have to give an antibiotic that you pay attention to the withdrawal period there. All right. So that's what he is doing in that pre-mortem inspection. The other thing he's doing as well is he's looking for a humane handle. He's watching that kind of stuff there. So for the last probably 15 to 20 years, the USDA has really been focused on humane handling. Not only humane slaughter, but humane handling of the animals coming off the trailer. And some of you may have experienced this because I've gotten phone calls from folks who are saying that they won't let me unload my own animal, all right? Part of the reason they're doing that is once that trailer, once your trailer enters their property, According to the USDA, they are responsible for the humane handling of that animal, all right? Even though you may technically still own that animal and you may not even drop it off, you're just taking it for a ride, let's say, I don't know. If it's on that meat processor's property, according to the USDA, they are responsible for the humane handling of that animal. And so that's why sometimes you'll see when you unload, you'll see the inspector standing there. He does that to us at the meat lab every once in a while, just to, just to do an audit, so to speak, of humane handling. And that's why some processors will say, you stay away, we'll unload it and so on and so forth. Because if you unload it roughly and you do it inhumanely, all right, they're still in trouble. Not necessarily you get in trouble, but the processor gets in trouble. So that's all part of that pre-mortem inspection. Make sure a humane, healthy animal is entering into the food chain, all right? The post-mortem inspection does a couple things. Number one, even though he looks at that animal alive and he appears to be healthy, we know that animals are really good about hiding when they're sick and they're really good about hiding when they're injured. And so if he is hiding being sick, that's when we're going to go through this process of the post-mortem inspection. Once the head comes off, the inspector is going to look at those mandibular lymph nodes. He's underneath the, your, your jaw there. Kind of the same thing your doctor does to you when he puts his, his hands around your neck there. All right. He's checking those lymph nodes if they make sure they're healthy. He's going to check several lymph node chains that are in the viscera as well. He's going to look at the liver. The liver is an edible byproduct. And so he wants to make sure that not only the liver's entering the food chain and it's a healthy liver, but it also gives you an indication of a healthy animal. He'll look at the lungs. He'll look at the heart. He'll look at the spleen. He'll look at the kidneys. He's going to look at all that stuff to make sure a healthy animal is entering into the food chain. The other part of that post-mortem inspection he's doing is making sure the facilities are clean and they're sanitary. He wants to make sure that not only the facilities are clean, but he's gonna make sure the personnel are uh, clean as well. He's gonna make sure the carcass is clean. If any contamination gets on that carcass, we trim that off. We don't wash it off. We trim that uh, contamination off of there. That's all part of that post-mortem inspection that happens on the kill floor. And then we go into the cutting room. So if we get into that raw ground and then that raw, not ground portion of the inspection, all right, again, making sure the facilities are clean, making sure the uh, cutters are clean. Now all of a sudden he wants to make sure that if it says ground beef, that it is ground beef, all right, that kind of stuff there. So he's got several roles that he's going to go through there as well. And this is important because if you're going to sell at a farmer's market or a roadside stand or something along those lines, that inspection legend has to go on that label. Okay, we're going to hit labels here towards the end. But there's several things that an inspector is going to do. All right. And this is why it's important that we go through this whole process of meat inspection to make sure that a healthy animal is entering into the food chain. Now, you heard me say that Upton Sinclair was kind of the birth of food safety with the jungle in 1906. To me, what's fascinating is it wasn't until the 1990s that we really became laser beam focused on food safety. It goes without saying now in the last, you know, 
uh, 20 some odd years to 30 years that we've been focused on food safety. But for me, I thought that was, that's kind of interesting. It wasn't until the early nineties that we really started to get laser beam focused on food safety. All right. So the next step. All right. So we got our animal that Dr. Van Valen was talking about, and now we've gone through the slaughter process and so on and so forth. There's some other things we got to think about ahead of time as well. And what better than John Wayne to kind of go through this and uh, introduce the next uh, uh, series of things we're going to talk about. I sure hope that some of the younger people know who John Wayne is. Every once in a while, my students remind me that I'm old. Okay. Um, production system. Again, this is one of those repeat things. This is, you say, well, Dr. Van Valen, she talked about this last week, and you're absolutely right, but I'm going to hit on this again because it's extremely important. What is your production system going to be? Are you going to be a grain finished facility? All right. And she hit on that stuff. She also talked about grain on grass or what she called the hybrid system, which is, which is a popular local system. Forage finished as well. I, some of you have heard me say this before. This is just me, my personal bias towards this. I don't like the phrase grass fed. All right. And the reason why I don't like the phrase grass fed is that animal spends 90% of its life eating what? Forage or grass or whatever you want to call that, all right? That goes on playing on some of the, the lack of knowledge that the general consumer has about animal husbandry and so on and so forth. But forage finish, grain finish, grain on grass. I'm going to take a little step further, all right? Natural. You'll see this uh, uh, phrase used out there as well. There is a legal definition for natural and everything in a grocery store meat case, fresh meat case fits that definition of natural. But that definition that's on the books is, has no similarities to what the popular definition is. And that's no antibiotics or no growth hormones given. That's what we popularly term as natural. There are some, some customers out there looking for that natural product. Another thing that is a very guarded phrase is organic, all right? I cannot begin to tell you how many people say, well, we're organic, all right? And, and I, you start digging and find out they're organic in what they do, but they're not USDA organic. And USDA is very protective of or, that organic uh, label there. So if you're going to use that phrase, that has to be approved, all right? And again, we're going to talk about this towards the end, kind of give a commercial of what's coming up. Very strict guidelines for what organic is, all right? We used to have a definition for grass finished or forage finished, but the USDA realized they cannot monitor that. So that definition went into moratorium there. I will say this, regardless of any of these production systems you choose or any of some of the others, some of them I didn't hit on. We have a lot of farmers in the state that are doing not only the grain finish, but they're doing the Wagyu breed, which is the kind of calling it the American Kobe beef. There's others that are doing some of these antique or, or heritage breeds as well. Whatever you want to get into, the one thing I want you to focus on is this whole concept of being local. If you're going to jump into these waters, I would encourage you to get online, register yourself with Kentucky Proud, and that allows you to use that brand, Kentucky Proud. There are people that go onto that website and look for farms around them that are Kentucky Proud. Dr. Van Valen, I caught her hitting on this uh, last week, I think Dr. Burdine's going to hit on this as well, is those people that are buying your product, whether it be a freezer beef program, a whether it's going to be a farmer's market, a roadside stand, or whatnot, they're buying your store, all right? They want to be able to have a dinner or a barbecue, and they're standing over the grill, and they've got everybody standing around them admiring the, the charred flesh that's being sizzled on the grill. They want to be able to say, we got this from such and such farm. And it's a farm that's been in the family for generations. Their kids are involved in 4-H and FFA. They want that story. The meat's just a byproduct. 
they they're buying your store. So it's very, very important that when you get into these systems that you get into this whole concept of being local, become Kentucky proud, doesn't cost you anything and be prepared to tell your story. That's what they want to hear, okay? Now, we got a production system, we've got our animal processed. How am I gonna sell this, all right? We call this freezer beef, all right? We call this program freezer beef. So if you're getting into solely the freezer beef program where you're gonna sell quarters, halves, or whole carcasses, all right? Here's the challenge you're going to run into, all right? Most people that are going to buy your product, their freezer is that space above their refrigerator or in my case, in my kitchen, it's beside my fridge. I have a side by side. The one I have in my basement is the traditional, you know, freezer on top. They're going to buy a quarter. They're going to buy a half. We're talking about hundred plus pounds. Whole carcass. We're talking about three to four hundred pounds. Not a lot of folks have that kind of space for frozen product. All right. What we're hearing out there, which I think is kind of neat, is what we're hearing the phrase beef share, where if you're going to sell somebody a half a beef, knowing full well, like you see beside behind me in, in, the, in my background, that's a half a beef, all right? They may not have the space, one family may not have the space to put all that in their freezer, but maybe they go together with the neighbor and the neighbor has half of that half and you have the other half or maybe a third person we've even heard of these becoming like parties where they go to the processor they get all that either a whole carcass or a half carcass and they've got all that meat sitting there glass of wine bourbon party whatever you want to cook at whatnot and they divvy up that carcass that's what we call a beef share and if you're able to do that i would encourage that to say hey, we're able to do this, but maybe see if your neighbor's interested. And it splits the cost, okay? It splits the cost. And it's one of those things where you may not be able to afford a whole beef, but maybe splitting it with uh, two or three other couples, families, you can. Freezer beef programs like that. We'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in depth here in a second as well. You may want to go into this uh, farmer's market or roadside stands, or even if you're going to sell off the farm, we have a few people do that. If you're going to get into that selling off the farm, you better let the health department know you're there. All right. So we start out with what's easy. All right. That's the freezer beef. Now we're going to start to get into things to get a little bit more work. Okay. So if we're going to get into this farmer's market, so now we went from selling a quarter, a half, or a whole beef animal. Now we're selling individual cuts. And we're doing this at a farmer's market. So guess what? That means Saturday mornings, Sunday mornings, guess where you're at? You're at a farmer's market, all right? Uh, if you're doing a roadside stand, you could be doing the same thing. Uh, off the farm, you have people coming to your place unexpectedly and so on and so forth. Individual cuts. Now, here is what we've noticed and we've seen out there of folks that are doing this kind of stuff. This is a lot of work, all right? When you go from the freezer beef to the farmer's market, we're talking about a lot more work there. Folks are more attuned to paying a premium for the desirable cuts of the ribeye, the strip loins, the T-bones, the fillets. They may not be willing to pay a premium for things like ground beef, chuck roast, round roast, whatnot. What we've had some folks do is they do this individual retail cuts, boom, they're sold out of ribeyes, they're sold out of strip steaks, T-bones, whatnot, sirloins. Now they're stuck with the undesirable cuts of the chuck roast and the arm roast and maybe the brisket or the, the uh, round cuts, round roast and things like that. We have had some people have success to where they're not stuck with some of that stuff is selling things in bundles. So maybe a $25 bundle has a couple of ribeyes in there, a couple of pounds of ground beef, a couple of roasts. Go up to a $50 bundle, we start increasing what we put in there, $100 bundle, and so on and so forth. Now we're getting into something that the individual consumer should have enough room in their freezer 
to handle. But if we're selling this in bundles, we're not stuck with stuff that people would not buy, okay? We've had a lot of people have success doing that kind of stuff. Freezer beef easy, farmer's market gets into a little bit more work. Then we get into internet sales. Now, you've heard me use this phrase challenge all the time. And I had a student, the reason why I threw this in here, um, I had a student ask me why I always say challenge. And it goes back, it's amazing what, how things stick out in your mind for some weird reason. Uh, a few years ago at our uh, uh, animal science reunion at Ag Roundup, we invited our baseball coach, uh, Coach uh, Nick Mangione, to come talk to us. And he said something that stuck with me. He said, I tell my players, don't come to me with problems or difficulties, come to me with challenges. And he said, problems and difficulties are negative, challenges are positive. You know, so it's, it's taking a different spin on there. So that's why you hear me say that a lot there. Now, we're getting into more challenge, okay? Internet sales, all right? We have a few people that do this internet sales. Again, retail cuts are bundles. Now, all of a sudden, the skill set level goes up a little bit more because now we have to develop a website. Maybe we get on the social media, all right? I'll be honest with you. I'm not a fan of social media for my personal life. I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter or Instagram or whatever that stuff is. Um, I'm thoroughly convinced that when in the Bible, when it talks about so many people are going to be saved, it's going to be those of us that are not on social media. All right. <laughs> if you're going to do this kind of stuff, <laughs> man, there we go. I, this is the challenge of doing this. There you go. That word challenge. I was doing this Zoom stuff is you don't always know how your jokes are going. But um, at any rate, I realize that my, my dojo master is a big fan of social media. That's a good way of promoting your stuff. That's a good way of letting people know what you have. So now all of a sudden we have to have a website. We have to have a social media presence that, well, hire a kid. I mean, that's the only thing I could tell you. If you're not comfortable with that stuff, kids are, you know. Now we also, since we're getting into internet sales, that becomes a bigger issue because if we're selling things over the internet, if you're selling it frozen, it has to arrive at the customer frozen as well. And so now all of a sudden our packaging costs go up. Now that shipping and handling that we hate to see from Amazon comes up. All right. This is where things get challenged. Labels. We're going to have to have some labels on there as well. And we may have to have approved labels. Like I said, at the end, we're going to talk about labels there. Okay. Freezer beef, farmer's market going a little bit higher. And, and the difficulty and challenges is internet sales, restaurants. All right. I hear this from a lot of people. I want to get into a restaurant. That's fine and wonderful. You're not going to get into a chain restaurant. All right. Um, could you get into a locally owned restaurant? Absolutely. The issue you're going to have with a locally owned restaurant, let's say you go to mom and pop's uh, family diner and you say, hey, I got 15 ribeyes. You want them? And they say, yes, give me those 15 ribeyes. We'll have them on, on special Friday and Saturday night. It's date night. People go out and all of a sudden they sell those. It was a huge success and they call you up on Monday morning, they said, hey, I need 15 more of those ribeyes. And you're going to say, I've got them, but they're still on the cattle and the cattle are still using those. Okay. So being able to meet their needs becomes extremely, extremely challenging. All right. Plus, we get back to what we talked about with the farmer's market and that internet sales is they want the good stuff. All right. So now you're still left with those in cuts and possibly some ground beef. So it's very challenging to do that. All right. Now, where we've seen people have success is of maybe you are a weekend feature. So mom and pop's uh, family diner, maybe this weekend we are featuring XYZ Farms ribeye steaks or something along those lines. You may be able to have some success doing that as a feature. All right. But not being able to to. Uh, to supply them on a regular basis. 
Here's another one I hear a lot of times. I want to be in Kroger. I'm just throwing them out there because they're the state's largest uh, grocery store. I want to be in Kroger. All right. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. Now, all of a sudden, if we get into in the Kroger, and you can ask the, the beef council with their beef solutions, ground beef product. Now the, the difficulty level and the challenge level goes up a lot higher because not only do you have to be USDA inspected, but the facility you're dealing with has to be GFSI certified. Global Food Safety Initiative is what that stands for. So we have inspection. This goes a step higher, or a couple steps higher. There's only a few processors in the state that are GFSI certified. We have a couple more going through the process, but to get into grocery stores like that, you're going to have to be GFSI certified. That's their regulations. The other thing is they have to want you. All right. You just cannot show up in Cincinnati at Kroger headquarters and say, boom, here I am, buy it. They have to want your product. They wanted beef solutions. They wanted that ground beef product. Okay. So it's, you try to go down that route. That's going to be extremely challenging. All right. Almost impossible for one farm to do that in this Louisville district or the Cincinnati district where uh, with Kroger, I'm just picking on Kroger because uh, they pop into my mind there. That's, I don't know very many single farms are going to be able to do that. They sell a lot of meat a week, okay? Several tons, all right? So that's going to be a challenge. Now, could you do a locally owned grocery store? Maybe, maybe, you know, but saying I'm going to get into Kroger is going to be a challenge. Then all of a sudden, now we get into those approved labels. We have to be extremely careful about what we put on labels. Again, we're going to talk about that here in a second. So you need to figure out what you're going to do. That rolls back in what we talked about earlier. What are my goals? What do I hope to achieve? So we got to not only have that USDA inspector, we got to pick out what production system we're going to do, how we're going to sell this product, all right? Whether we're going to do farmer's market, freezer beef, or we are going to try to get that golden ring of getting into a grocery store, all right? So I told you I was going to talk about picking a grocery store, all right? Or pick, excuse me. Picking a meat processor, all right, can be intimidating. And so you see these two guys going at it. It's pretty intimidating. I wish my uh, spinning hook kick was as high and as good as that guy's there. Uh, but it can be intimidating talking to a meat processor, all right? So picking and working with a processor, all right? We know whatever production system we get into, we're going to have to be USDA inspected. I realize that location is always going to be important. All right. Um, you may have a tremendous meat processor, but he's down around Paducah. Okay. That's a long way for you guys to go. All right. Likewise, if they're in Paducah, it's a long ways to go up to a processor in, in Northern Kentucky as well. So I know location is going to be important. All right. Once you decide you're going to do this and you decide how you're going to sell this, this product. All right. I encourage you to schedule a meeting with that processor, right? Remember that example I talked about at the beginning where that individual asked me, what do I need? I said, you have to be inspected. And then he got in trouble with the USDA because not everything was inspected. Okay. That goes back to him not being very transparent with that processor, being like the ghost. Ghosts are transparent, right? This is where you're going to have to sit down and talk with that processor and tell that processor this is what I am wanting to do, all right? And discuss your goals with him and how he can help you. And he may tell you some pitfalls that he has uh, had with other folks that are trying to do this kind of stuff as well. But sit down with him and discuss what you're wanting to do. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about here towards the end is the challenge everybody's having is I can't get into a processor, all right? Once you get in there and you sit down and talk with him, maybe you need to think about how many animals you're going to do a week, a month, a quarter, all right? If you tell him, I'm doing 30 animals a week, you better do 30 animals a week, all right? If you say, I'm going to do five animals a month, which is probably a little bit more realistic, you better do five animals a month. That way he can count on those you 
and your five animals a month. All right. And he's, if he can count on you, he's more likely to give you those spots on the schedule. All right. But if you say, I'm going to do 30 animals a week, knowing full well, you're only going to bring five a month. You're going to lose your, your, uh, your spot pretty quick. So you need to be pretty transparent and think about what you can and can't do. All right. Once you walk away from that meeting, I want you to do this. I want you to ask yourself, can I work with this individual? Can I work with this company? All right. Because this is going to be a marriage and you need to, if you get a bad feeling or you just don't feel like you're being very welcome there, chances are it's not going to be a very easy relationship to work with. All right. Other things I want you to think about, all right, especially if you're doing a freezer beef program where you're saying, okay, I'm going to deliver this live animal to the processor. You got to go get it and you got to pay the slaughter fees and the processing fees and so on. Think about these little things that people don't always consciously think about, but you subconsciously think about. What does the parking look like? Excuse me. What does the parking lot look like? That's kind of hard to say after uh, after your uh, several hours on Zoom. What does the parking lot look like? What does the outside of the facilities look like? What is that, as they say in reality, that curbside impression, all right? That curbside appearance, yeah, yeah, that curbside attraction. Because you're if you're going to send your customers there, if they pull in and it's a ratty old parking lot and everything looks run down and beat down and run down outside, that doesn't leave a very good impression, all right? What does inside the facility look like, all right? Again, it goes back to that impression. Do the staff appear to be friendly, all right? Um, what does it smell like, all right? Meat processing facilities have their own smell. Um, I vaguely remember what it smells like. I've been doing this for 32, 33 years. I think I used to be able to smell it. Now I don't smell anything, but they have their own smell. Okay, we know that. Is there a foul smell? All right. I've had somebody call me one time. They said, um, it smells like bleach. That's not a bad thing. Okay, if it smells like bleach, that's not bad. That means it's clean. That means it's sanitary, that kind of stuff there. If they have a retail meat case, what do the retail meat cuts in there look like? Because that's going to be representative of what you get or what your customers get as well. If you don't like the look of those retail cuts, it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. There's that word again. It's going to be a challenge to get them to change what they're going to do. All right. So other things to kind of think about as you go through this, that, that curb appeal, if you will, on your, your, your cuts and your processor as well. All right. What happens when things go wrong? All right. Um, I have been married for 21 years. I've been with the same woman for 27 years. We have mortgage, we have debt, we have a child together. And every once in a while, I can guarantee you my wife wants to take me to my meat lab and throw me in a grinder. All right. So even if you're married, you understand that every relationship is going to have a challenge. This is what's going to happen. It's going to happen with a meat processor, okay? It's not, you know, like I heard this morning on NASCAR radio, it wasn't if Kyle Larson was going to win a race, win a race. it was when he was going to win a race, and he won yesterday's race there in Las Vegas. But it's not whether or not you're going to have a challenge with your meat processor, it's when. OK, and so if there's something that goes wrong with your meat processor, what do you do? And it's just like a relationship. You need communication. All right. And if that doesn't work, you need to communicate with them again. Only do we get down to that third one. Do we start to have this communication again where we say, well, maybe if we don't get this fixed, maybe I need to go somewhere else. All right. And the reason why I say we need to have that communication, 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 because if you have to go to another meat processor, you're starting all over again and you're throwing money away. All right. Um, you don't want to do that. I, I can tell you right now, and any of us have worked with, with folks that do this direct marketing usually if they start switching meat processors it is it's a it's an issue all right it's an issue that it's hard to overcome because now all of a sudden we got to start 
all over with how we want things to do. So if you can try to work out this relationship, there's always going to be something that goes wrong. There's always going to be challenges, but we want to make sure that we try to work through those through communication as well. So talking to your meat process, I've heard this many times. I, I you know, folks call me up and they are intimidated. They're intimidated, kind of like Leatherface here. They're intimidated by their meat process. He, big guy he comes out, he's got blood on him, and so he's very intimidating. Or he's like our IT guy, all right? Uh, he's saying things I don't understand, you know? So maybe I give you a little bit of survival uh, meat process or ease, all right? So speaking their language, I, I, I don't realize this until I start teaching in the fall and I start saying things and I can look at my students' faces and they've got that confused look on their face when I start using this meat process or ease, or even when we're in a, in a situation where I'm talking to you guys one-on-one -on -one and I'll say something and I can almost tell that I just said something, you have no idea what I've said, all right? I don't want you to be intimidated. I want you to ask questions. I don't want you to, I, don't get me wrong, I love my IT guy to death that we have in our in our uh, in our department there in animal and food science. But there's times I look at Kevin, I say, Kevin, I'm having problems with my computer. He comes down to fix him. He's telling me what's going wrong. The words coming out of his mouth are English. I just don't know what he is saying. I don't understand it because I don't know this whole computer electronic thing. You know, much beyond opening up internet and doing a presentation and Zoom like we're doing now. If it goes wrong outside of turning it off and, and, and turning it back on, I don't know how to fix that kind of stuff. It's my responsibility to ask Kevin, Kevin, what do you mean by a SCSI drive? I don't understand that, okay? Ask questions. If you don't understand something, ask questions. It's as much your responsibility as it is his to make sure you understand each other, all right? So here are some things that you're going to hear your meat processor say. Some of that goes back to what we talked about inspection, raw ground plans, uh, raw not ground, you know, those kind of things. Here's some other things that I think you, you know, you may need, all right? And if there's, at the end, if there's things you've heard meat processor say, ask me and we'll try to figure that out. All right, you may call him up and he says, okay, how things going? He says, he dressed, he dressed this, all right? And you're thinking, why did you dress this animal? Okay. What he's getting at is a dressing percentage. All right. Dressing percentage is a phrase that we use in the meats industry. It is the difference between the live weight and the hot carcass weight. All right. And there's lots of things that are going to affect this. All right. Normally cattle will dress in that 60 to 63. As you see on here, we have grain finished animals between 62 and 64 on the table. You can see dairy, heifer, grass finished, more gut fill, so on and so forth. Basically there's things that go into the live weight that don't go into the carcass weight. And you're saying, well, what do you mean grass finish has a lower dressing percentage? You see here it's between 50 to 55 to 60% because Eating forage causes that rumen to grow. They basically have more gut, so to speak, all right? So there's things that can affect it. I get in this a lot of times. Low dressing percentage. Well, when's you feeding? Well, right before he took him, all right? Gut fill. So that goes into the live weight, but it doesn't go into the caucus weight. Hide contamination. We're getting to that time of year where it's gonna start getting muddy outside because we're transitioning from frozen ground to wet ground, all right? If we're the poor folks in Eastern Kentucky that are going through flooding, there's gonna be a lot of mud out there. Mud and manure that's caked on the side of that animal, on that height of that animal, that's going to go into the live weight, but it's not gonna go into the, the hot carcass weight. That's gonna drive that dressing percentage down there. Horns, I don't know very many that have horns, but just in case, a wet udder, maybe you've got a coal cow that you're taking in for ground beef, got this huge 50 pound wet udder, that's gotta come off on the kill floor, it's gonna drive that down. Here's the other thing as well, lost, can they can lose 100 pounds overnight just by going off feed and emptying out that digestive system, you'll see it in the pen in the morning. I've seen them lose 100 pounds overnight. 
The other thing too, I got into this uh, several years ago. Um, processor weighed him, he weighed this. The uh, farmer said, no, he weighed this. Get to the bottom of it. Processor used the scale and weighed him. The, uh, the uh, farmer just thought he looked like he weighed 1,100 pounds, okay? So accurate weights and so on and so forth. So we got to get into this whole concept of understanding what this dressing percentage is. So th this is that first phrase you're going to hear sometimes. He dressed. He may not say dressing percentage. He may say he dressed 60% or something like that. All right. He shrank. There's another one where you might be thinking, well, I thought I was going to get a little bit more now. I said, well, he, he shrank up. You know, he could be using that phrase, he shrank interchangeably with what we just talked about, that dressing percentage and the losing of weight. He could also be talking about carcass shrink, all right? So this is why we have a thing called hot carcass weight and cold carcass weight. Those carcasses hanging there, so even in that picture, you see that meat sit, uh, sitting on the block top there, it's around 70 to 75% water, all right? And in that first 24 hours, we're going to get a lot of evaporative cooling. We can lose three to 5% of that carcass weight in the first 24 hours that is in that cooler due to evaporative cooling. All right. Obviously, if he's a trimmer carcass, he doesn't have much fat on him. He's going to be closer to that 5%. If he's a fatter carcass, he's going to be close to that two to three percent loss in the first 24 hours. Doesn't seem like much, but you start calculating a 600 pound carcass and five percent of that, that's a pretty big number all of a sudden. All right. So, you know, understand. And if, you know, if he uses that phrase, he shrank, he could be talking about that shrink overnight and he could be talking about that carcass shrink. All right. Just ask that question what he's talking about. He may also use this phrase when you talk about, okay, how much am I going to bring home? Well, he yielded about this, all right? Yield is a lot of times the phrase that we use talking about cutting loss, how much you're going to take home. And cutting loss is an interesting thing because that can be determined by what you want out of the carcass. Maybe you wanted your cuts to be eighth inch trim or a quarter inch trim we're talking about the fat on the outside of the the subcutaneous fat or maybe you didn't want any trim on the outside all right that's going to contribute to that cut loss maybe there's something in that animal an abscess or a bruise that we had to cut out okay that goes in that cutting loss and sometimes it goes back to the actual skill of the meat cutter as well um Brock, my meat lab manager, when he was an undergrad, I taught him how to cut meat. Brock graduated, went to work for a couple other meat processors before coming back to be the meat lab manager here at UK. And I can tell you right now, even though I taught Brock how to cut meat, I'm fairly confident the DNA of my teachings are in there, but Brock cuts totally different than I do. And so there are times just out of just fun, he and I cut up the same animal he took one side i took the other and we're 5 10 15 20 pounds difference between us just by what he probably threw something out i kept or vice versa all right so just be aware if he uses that term yield or shrink sometimes he might use those interchangeably so you might have to ask what they're actually talking about there but understand dress shrink and yield okay those are uh, three common phrases you hear sometimes all right the big one, how do you want it cut? And with a knife is not the correct answer, all right? What he's getting at is how do you want that carcass cut up? Most of those guys have a cut sheet. They have a sheet that you fill out. Do I want chuck roast or do I want chuck steaks or I want all that ground? They'll have all that stuff for you in those, those cut sheets, all right? Once again, if you don't understand what a particular cut is, you should ask. You can also get these nice colorful charts that we have up here from the uh, Beef Council. Um, these guys right here, from my, my highlighter pointer now, you can get these. You just call Kentucky Beef Council up and say, hey, can I get a couple of those? And they'll send those to you. And so if you're not familiar with a cut, so 
I'm just going to pick on this guy right here off the sirloin. He may say, he may offer you a tri-tip. I they probably won't, but he may offer you a tri-tip. You'd have never heard that before. Tri-tip is a very California cut, all right? Uh, you, you know, we, you see them every once in a while here in the uh, Southeast. You see them sometimes in the Midwest as well, uh, but not a very common cut. If he offers that and you don't know what that is, you'll know. Okay, you get these pieces like this, all right? These sheets like this. Um, if you do want something like a tri-tip, okay, you may have to negotiate that, you know, with, uh, yeah, he may not have or have that cut offer, all right? So if there's something unique that you want in there, maybe you want some of the new beef cuts, you want chuck eye steaks, you want country style ribs, you want, you know, ribeye fillets, or you want sirloin fillets or something along those lines, some of these new what the uh, beef council calls BAM, beef alternative merchandise. There's new BAM cuts. You may have to negotiate that with them and you may have to pay a little bit more for that as well. So those cut sheets, make sure you understand that. Ask questions if you don't understand. Uh, they'll always ask you how thick, all right? Uh, how thick do you want your steaks? How thick do you want your roast? How big you want your roast, all right? If it comes to steaks, I'm always a big fan of one inch. And the reason why I'm a big fan of one inch is inch thick steak number one you know that's that's a good thickness for just an everyday steak the other thing is too is it prevents overcooking all right we can have a whole other discussion on tenderness what affects tenderness another discussion on what affects flavor um when we get into those two how that product was cooked is going to dictate a lot of that all right if a consumer overcooks that and it's dry and it's not very flavorful, whose fault is it? Well, it's going to be you. It's going to be the meat processor. You say, but they overcooked it. This is America. I'm not responsible for my own actions. It's always going to be your fault. So I say inch thick, you know, somewhat jokingly, I'm using the average American's lack of attention span against them. They'll get tired of it and maybe won't overcook it. Okay. So I always suggest an inch thick on that kind of stuff there. Roast size is up to you. Sometimes they'll say, how many pounds do you want? How, how, you know, or they may say, how thick, all right? And just you know, be aware if you say, well, I want my roast to be about three pounds and it comes out three and a half or four pounds or maybe two and a half, they're eyeballing that kind of stuff, all right? So just have a little bit of patience with that kind of stuff there as well. Other things that you're going to hear processors talk about that you kind of need to understand as well is this aging thing. Um, I can tell you right now with the pandemic happening, and I hope and pray that we're towards the end of the pandemic, that the light that we're seeing at the end of the tunnel is not a train. Um, more and more of us are getting vaccinated as well. I've already gone through my two rounds of vaccines. But I can tell you right now, because of the pandemic and the challenge it is for you as the farmer to get your animals into a meat processor, um, I have more and more people call me up and saying, I want to start a meat processing facility. That's a whole nother subject there as well. But the one thing I tell these folks in all my years of working with processors and all the states that I've worked with meat processors, I have never, ever once had one tell me they have too much cooler and too much freezer. So a lot of times it's aging, the letting that carcass hang there, all right? The reason why we age beef is to make it more tender. It has nothing to do with the quality grade. I've heard that a few times in the last uh, few months as well. Aging makes it more tender, all right? And so sometimes they may only age at carcass, you know, seven to 10 days at the most, all right, because they're trying to turn that cooler over. They may even do shorter than that if you negotiate to go longer, all right. Just realize that even though the longer we age those guys, the more tender they become, but to use kind of an economics term, we get into this case of uh, the law of diminishing returns, where even though I'm getting a return on a tenderness, I'm losing things because I'm going to have to carve more and more of that dehydrated surface going back to that yield, going back to that cutting loss. I'm going to lose that. So you can see in these, this picture here, we've got some mold on these cuts down here. These are some dry aged uh, uh, or wholesale cuts. 
Uh, we're going to have to trim that off. See that yellow fat on there. We're going to have to trim that off. That's going to decrease the yield on these guys. Decrease that yield, decrease the amount of product you're going to be able to sell. Consequently, the reason why they're doing this, this is probably a restaurant setting. I don't remember where I got this picture, but they're going to charge a little bit more for that as well. All right. So when we get into that aging concept, just understand what you're going through is what we call dry aging. We'll talk about that here in a second is, you know, if you go push those carcasses to a longer aging period, you're going to, your yield is going to be reduced because we're going to have to carve some of that, that dehydrated surface off of there. Um, the other thing too, is if they don't get it on there, take that, that old kind of beef jerky looking surface and they grind it, you're going to have little black specks in your ground beef and your consumers are not going to like that as well, your customers. Packaging. I'm going to encourage you. I think most processors do this vacuum package. All right. Vacuum package. It may cost you a little bit more, but the reason why I want you to vacuum package is once it's in there, oxygen sucked out of the, out of the product, uh, the package, we can put that in the freezer. And now we reduced our, our uh, opportunity for freezer burn. All right. And reason why I want you to do that is because that consumer that's bought your product, they want the very last steak out of that freezer to taste like the very first one. And the only way you can do that and avoid freezer burn is to go into this vacuum package system. All right. Again, educate yourself on vacuum packages. Just because it's vacuum package doesn't mean you can throw it across the room. You will bust the vacuum and so on and so forth. Sorry, I have to drink it dry here. Here's the ultimate question. All right. Get this a lot. Talk about this in Master Cattleman. Those of you gone through Master Cattleman. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've gotten in, I don't know how many years of doing these, fielding these phone calls. Took a 1,200 pound animal, came home with about 350, 400 pounds of meat. That lousy blah, 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 blah is stealing my beef. All right. In the years of doing this, I've never, ever had that situation where a meat processor was keeping your product to sell on his own. Never seen. All right. Have I had them forget to give you a box or misplace a box? Absolutely. Okay. But here's what's going on. I'm just going to pick 1,200 pounds because that's usually the average that we take animals into the processor Granted, you know, when we talk about nationally, we're talking about closer to 1,500 pound national slaughter average there. 1,200 pound animal, I'm just going to say he's dressed around 60%. So there's that phrase again. So that's the dressing percentage again. That's the difference between the live weight and the hot carcass weight. So dress about 60% gives you about a 720 pound carcass. Let's say he shrank because he's 1,200 pounds. So you probably don't have a whole lot of fat on him. He had a 4% shrink in the first 24 hours. And so now we're talking about a 690-ish cold carcass weight, all right? You tell the processor, I want it boneless. That skeleton can be around 20% of that carcass weight. So now all of a sudden you start seeing that number dive down there, all right? I usually tell folks you're going to take home about 30 to 35 percent of that live weight. All right. And this becomes an important factor here in a second, understanding what's going on here. All right. So you are out of that 1200 pound animal going to bring home around 350 to 400 pounds of product that's going to go into your refrigerator or into your freezer. Again, these are not hard and fast numbers. I wish the people that would that when they call me up, I wish I could give you a hard and fast number. This is a boneless uh, situation. If we got bone in or some boneless, some boneless, that's going to affect that 360 pounds. If I want lean ground beef versus a fattier, more of a 70, 30 ground beef, that's going to affect that as well. Okay. So there's little things that can affect that. All right. So we need to I wish these were hard and fast numbers. That's why I give you this, this range between 30 to 35%. If you go over 35%, cool, wonderful. 
You go under, you understand we're in that range, okay? And if for some weird reason you're under that 30%, probably call them up and say, was there something that went wrong? You know, did we have an abscess that they had to cut out? Was there a big bruise or something along those lines that had to cut out? So, so just be aware that, you know, you're not, they're not stealing your stuff, okay? Pricing, all right? I'm going to give a little bit of a commercial for what you're going to to deal with when we start talking with Dr. Burdine, when we start talking with Dr. Halich as well. Those two guys, when it comes to economics, they're wonderful sources of information. And I just want you to understand, okay? There's a difference between, between profit and cash flow. Just because you got money coming in doesn't necessarily mean you're making money, okay? And one of the things I want you to think about before these two gentlemen, Dr. Halich and Dr. Burdine, talk to you is when we get into this price and we get into economics of it, I want you to start thinking about your production costs, all right? Think about the processing costs, the slaughter fee, the uh, processing costs, how many, you know, is it a dollar per hundred weight, you know, or a dollar per pound to, to cut this animal up. And think about your break even cost and think about your labor, account for your labor in there. All right. These guys may start talking about business models. Do you, you know, do you have to develop a business model that goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning? What goals are you wanting? You know, what you're going to go through and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to dwell on this because I let the econ guys do this. Uh, those two guys and, and I, we have a very good relationship. Uh, if it comes to pricing, I send them to those two. If they have a processing, they send them to me. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good relationship. That's why they call us specialists. Those guys specialize in money. I specialize in killing things. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, of a commercial of what those two gentlemen are going to talk about. Things to discuss with your customers. All right, let's go back to that whole freezer beef thing. Some of you are probably selling them the live animal, all right? So if you're selling them the live animal, that opens up your options a little bit more. If that person owns that live animal and they're just going to take the meat off that animal and it's going to go into their freezer, they're not going to sell it. It's just going into their freezer. They own the live animal. Now, all of a sudden, we can do a custom guy we we don't have to have a usda or even we have usda we don't have to have it slaughtered under inspection they're not going to sell it okay doing the live you may do it on carcass weight i don't know if very many folks that do that but that freezer beef thing all right whether you're doing the live animal or you're doing the carcass weight these are things you need to communicate with your customers because let's say if you're selling him the live weight you charge him for a 1200 pound animal. He comes home with 400 pounds of meat. He's got some questions. So it's, it's to your benefit to say, okay, this crazy guy at UK, he, he told me this. All right. And I've got a, an extension pub. We'll try to get that out to you as well. That goes through these breakdowns for you that you can give them to understand it. And I, and I, I can tell you right now, I have had that question before I bought an animal off this guy. He charged me for an 1100 pound animal. I got 350 pounds, something, you know, they get upset. All right. This is that communication thing. All right. Need to understand and communicate with them what's going on there. Dry age versus wet age. We talked about that aging thing there. Okay. Retailers, if you go to the grocery store and those individuals have been raised on eating meat that came from a grocery store, that product is wet aged. And what do I mean by wet aged? That means it became more tender inside a vacuum bag. So the life and times of that carcass came in, went through the slaughter process. As soon as it made HACCP temp, usually which about 24 hours later, it was cut up into wholesale cuts, primals and subprimals, put inside a vacuum bag, put inside a box, box beef, okay? And it took around 20 to 25 days to make its way from the packing plant in Joslin, Illinois. I'm just, that's the first one to pop in my head. It made, took about 20 to 25 days to go from Joslin, Illinois, all the way through the warehouse system and through the shipping system to get to your grocery store's door. 
it aged inside that vacuum bag. We call that wet aging, okay? Now you're working with a processor. This thing is going to be dry aged. That carcass is just hanging there like the, like the background I have behind there. Those are dry aged carcasses. Dry age is that buzzword. It's that sexy culinary word when it comes to beef. We have dry aged beef at our restaurant. Be aware, dry age and wet age has a little bit different flavor, all right? They may not be able to pick out that different flavor nuances in a wholesale or a retail cut, I'm sorry. They will be able to pick it out in ground beef, which has a little bit more fat, all right? Dry aged beef has been described as earthier, nuttier. I had a student say it tastes like more blue cheesier, which is really cool because blue cheese pairs up really well with, uh, with beef. Uh, I will say from experience, we at the meat lab, we sell dry aged ground beef has a little bit more of a metallic flavor. Okay. I can tell you right now, I've had several phone calls from not only uh, customers like yourself, but even your customers saying it tasted funny. 99% of the time it goes back to that whole aging thing. All right. Dry age versus wet age. If you choose to get into this forage finished, okay. Forage finish as a different flavor than grain finish, all right? And so if you've been raised on your own beef and you're probably used to the forage finish, if you're selling to somebody who's solely been raised in grocery store meat, not only dealing with a wet age situation, we're dealing with a grain finish situation as well. And so those, those products are going to taste a little bit different, Okay. And I can remember Dr. Limcooler and I, we, we did a program years ago um, at a county where they, we taste tested and the, and the uh, participants did this as well. Taste tested grass finished beef or forage finished beef and grain finished beef. Couldn't really tell much of a difference in the retail cuts, could tell a huge difference in the ground product. So the ground beef. So again, communicate that with your customer so they understand that if they're getting a dry age, forage finish, it's going to have a different flavor than what you're going to get in the grocery store as well. Looping back up the freezer space, freezer beef, understand folks that here's a good kind of calculation. I don't know how much my freezer will hold about 30 to 40 pounds per cubic foot of freezer. Okay. You give them that next thing we got to figure out is how many cubic feet are actually in their freezer. And I can tell you right now, I have no idea how, many cubic feet are in my freezer. Hopefully it says it on the door. Uh, so that's what, kind of a good rule of thumb if you get into this freezer beef program and somebody says, well, I don't know how much you know my freezer will hold. That 30 to 40 pounds cubic feet is what it's going to hold. That's not accounting for the pizzas and the other stuff that are inside there, the ice trays and things like that. So I understand that's an, that's an empty space, okay? Um, I promise you we talk about this labels. We are attracted to labels, all right? You've seen me drinking every once in a while. I'm actually drinking a monster. Get that in there so you can see that. That's kind of a cool label. It's got colors. It's got the shimmering there and so on and so forth. It's got that big M on there. We're attracted to labels, whether we realize it or not. Subconsciously, we're attracted to it. When you start getting into this and you start getting into this label stuff, all right, Realize that there's a generic label. This is a generic label, all right? These are the easiest. Sometimes your, the, uh, your processor's meat inspector can approve this for you. You're not doing anything but saying, this is who we are, farm name. This is the cut. This is what it is. This is what it comes off of, the loin. It's bone in. They threw in grill for best results. I don't disagree with that on a porterhouse steak. This is how much it weighed. This is how much it was per pound. This is the total price. Um, this is an older label because it has product of US on there, but they're always going to have to have these safe handling instructions on there. That is a generic label. Those are the easiest to get approved. Now, all of a sudden, if we start making claims, okay, and I got a couple of them up here. Again, you see this USDA organic. Remember, we talked about being that being a protected 
label. That is a program. If you are in that organic program and you are USDA organic, meaning you've got third party audits and so on and so forth, you can use that label. You have to have that approved. Here's another one that says non GMO product verified. Again, that has to be approved. Look down here in this ground beef, American Heart Association. We are making a claim. Those have to be approved by the government. Here's a common one. No hormones. I get this all the time. I tell folks, if you're making a claim that it has no hormones, it'll never be approved. Well, we don't give implants. It has natural hormones. Now, you can say no hormones given. Okay, you're okay there. If you use the phrase low fat, low calorie, high protein, etc., you know, there's definitions for what those are. All right. Healthy. I, I, I love that. I had this discussion with a, with a uh, student just the other day. Well, it's healthier. What do you mean healthier? I know the definition, but healthy means different things to different people. Okay. Me, healthy is low calorie, high protein. That's healthy for me. Some of you might be something different there. Just know when you, you start making these claims, you're going to have to have them approved. And so if you want to go down that road of having things approved, all right, you can go through the whole process yourself, send it off. It might be a few months before you hear back from them and they say unapproved, this is why. And you go through the whole process again, or you could hire a label expediter. That's what folks at the, uh, Kentucky Cattlemen's Association did when they did got into the whole uh, beef solutions. They hired a label expediter. This person knows the ins and outs can get your your uh, label approved fairly rapidly, week week two weeks or so. All right, so we get into those labels, okay? And again, I can talk more on labels and but have to research more on labels as well as well. But um, we start getting into labels, you know, we got to have that kind of stuff there. So with that being said, conclusions, all right? Do your homework. Um, realize that this can be a lot of work. I've had a few folks that, that got into this direct marketing that looked like they were going to be pretty successful, looked like they had some fun, and all of a sudden they disappear, and I run into them and I say, well, I got too much work. I, I, I'm better being just a farmer, you know? Have realistic goals, all right? Chances are you're probably not going to get into Kroger, all right? Uh, if you want to be the next Laura's lean, you know, understand Sam Walton started with one store. He didn't automatically open up a, a global conglomerate. He started with one store. So that's that realistic thing. Um, I realized this, and this is why I waited to the uh, very end to kind of talk about this. I understand we're going through a situation right now where it's very difficult for you to get your animals into a processor. Soon as the pandemic hit, um, meat processors went, their demand went through the roof. Um, I'll never forget when we started going through this, it was May of last year, I was talking to one of our processors in the state and he says, I'm already starting to book into, this was May, he says, I'm already starting to book into October. And I said, okay, I'm going to come see you in a couple of weeks. I got there and he says, I'm starting to take bookings into 2021. Now I'm hearing some of them are booked into 2022. Talk to another meat processor. He's not a USDA. He's a custom guy. And I've been on him for years to be USDA. Right now he says it doesn't pay him to be USDA because he's, he's already too more, more work than he can handle. It's not slowing down anytime soon. So we understood that. Uh, I say we as in the government and everything else um, got a phone call saying, hey, we've developed this uh, meat processing expansion committee. It's a subcommittee of the Ag Development Board. We're putting money into trying to expand processing in the state um, through not only money that's come out of the Ag Development Board, but also with the CARES Act. They, they earmarked about two million from the CARES Act as well. Um, we're slowly starting to increase uh, processing in the state. What this did for processors is, is the money out there did a few things for them, allowed them to buy technology that makes them more efficient, allowed them to do some remodeling, either increase cooler size. I've had a few that have increased their uh, uh, 
kill floor, bought new technology for the kill floor. It allows them to cut faster. Others have bought packaging technology. Also, uh, uh, you know, giving money to those that are absolutely serious about opening up their, their own facility as well. So we're, we've done a really good job of expanding processing in the state. I know that doesn't help those of you that, that um, I can't get an animal in there, but we're, we are working on that. We're having some success as well. Make sure you ask questions. If you don't understand it, ask your agents, ask me, ask your processors as well. And with that, uh, gone on for about an hour and a half now. Actually, it was the shortest Zoom meeting I've had today. So yes, we're done. Questions for me? Anybody have questions? I have to unmute. I know there's no basketball game on tonight, so. Questions? Looks like we've got some comments in the chat box over yeah, here. Yeah, I definitely uh, we would there. Yeah, so. I'm going to stop sharing here, so you, unless you guys like enjoy seeing Thor. <laughs> I thought it was a nice touch. Yeah. <laughs> Works for uh, so, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm, what you got in the chat box there, Michelle? Okay. Um, Sharon Spencer commented, there is a www.kentuckyproud.com. If you are wanting to register your products with the Kentucky Proud program, uh, that's a pretty easy sign up process too. Yeah. Um, there's another question. If selling half or whole beef, can you register with Kentucky Proud? Yes. Yep. Okay. And then um, Sharon has a comment out here with the Sharon's with the Kentucky Department of Ag. So thanks for logging on tonight. That's always helpful to have those resources. Here during the meeting. Uh, the Kentucky Proud Marketing Program assists Kentucky producers in marketing Kentucky grown, processed, or manufactured agricultural products locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, if you have any questions, she's saying feel free to reach out to her. Her email is sharon.spencer at ky.gov. Yeah. yeah, and like I said, like we talked about earlier, um, you have to tell your story. Folks, this, you know, we have a new classification, we say new, we've been using this classification of consumers for a while called local vores. Those the individuals that seek out local products. And so that Kentucky Proud is a good way of, uh, of satisfying that need for those local vores. Other questions, comments, speeches? Dr. Greg, Don, Don yeah. here. Hey, you, Don. Had a, you had a slide there that um, you mentioned uh, uh, custom processors and uh, folks selling, uh, you know, half a beef by the pound or live weight. You also had there uh, underneath that uh, carcass weight. Uh, yeah. What's explain that a little bit more if somebody's yeah. going to custom operation? Yeah, and I, I threw that in there. I, I know. Most of you that do the freezer beef, you're probably selling on the live weight. Uh, but I have heard of some that are selling on the hot carcass weight. So that's usually a higher price because they're accounting for, you know, the live weight versus the carcass price there. Um, that's where instead of paying for the animal, now you're paying for the carcass. Um, if you're, if you're, sell you know call cattle to the beef solutions they pay on the 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 carcass weight uh so that's essentially so instead of paying for the 1200 pounds you're paying for the the 720 pounds so to speak again that price per pound is going to be higher there so that's what i mean by uh paying on carcass weight i don't know if that answers your question or not well it, is that still legal i'm assuming from a from a um, standpoint they don't if, no you're, other... if you're wanting to go the custom route i would right. i would do the live weight uh if you're want something in there and you just want to you know you got an and this is what we're having now is animals have gotten away because we had a big bottleneck there about a, almost a year ago um you, if you're doing the carcass weight then we we need to go down that inspection route What if the, uh, one, one last question, what if the, cons the customer is paying for the processing? So in other words, the, the farmer is out of, he's not involved in the, 
you know, the harvesting of that animal or paying for the that. So basically, the consumer is working with the processor. Yeah, the consumer, throughout the whole process. Yeah, they own the animal, right. right? So they pay the farmer for the animal. The farmer can be nice enough because I don't know a whole lot of folks that they're going down this route that would have a trailer and whatnot. Um, that consumer, they own the animal now. So they're the ones that have to pay the processing fees and the slaughter fees and sit down with the processor, processor to make sure they get it cut up. You go in that route, uh, unless it's inspected, you can't sell it. So we're just talking about that's that sole freezer beef program there. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. We've got some questions in the chat box over here. Let me scroll back up. Um, we have an iPhone user asking, <clears throat> excuse me, do you recommend bone in or boneless cuts? Interesting. Um, obviously, your yield, that board again that we talked about, that meat processor ease, um, your yield is going to be higher with bone in cuts. Now, um, Here's what I have heard, and I continue to hear this, and some of you are going to find this fascinating, what I'm about to say here. My retail meat cutters that I've worked with, even guys that high up in Kroger, they tell me, unless it has bone in the name, like T-bone, all right, consumers shy away from boning cuts. And at first, I thought when they would start telling me that consumers really don't want boning cuts, I thought, well, maybe, well, I'm paying for the bone, but I can't eat the bone type thing. Here's what we're being told, and I'm sorry, folks. We're being told that people like boneless cuts because if it has a bone in it, that reminds them that it was a living animal, and they don't want to think about that when they're eating. So if your consumer base is like that, you're probably more likely to have to go down that boneless route. Um, there are some old school people out there tell you when we took the bone out, we took the flavor. Out. I don't know. I'm not, my palate's not that discriminative. Um, so you just kind of have to go with your consumers. One, you can ask them, you want bone in cuts, you want boneless cuts and, and let them tell you which way to go. But it is kind of interesting that we are having people tell us that they don't like to think about it once being a living animal, so to speak. So I hope that answers your question. I can tell okay. you, we sell everything through the butcher shop there. Okay. Uh, next question on here, and this might come ahead. up in the next program. Uh, what do you think a fair price is for a live weight Angus steer per pound? That I have zero, I can't even, I can't even guesstimate on that. I would, I would let <laughs> you guys uh, talk to uh, Dr. Halleck or Dr. Birdine on that one. I wouldn't even begin to know what to, what to tell you on that one. Okay. I think they, they plan to talk about that next week. Yeah. So um, I, I, I've seen Kenny's Dr. Burdine stuff and he is going to elaborate that on that as well. And I, I, I would suspect a few of the other economists are going to do that too. Okay. Okay. Um, so Sharon has some more information and you all can view this chat box too. If you go down to the bottom of your screen and click chat, uh, you'll be able to see all these messages that I'm reading off as well. Um, but Kentucky Proud members can also apply for the Kentucky Proud promotional grant that can assist with marketing and advertising. So you just have to be a member before you can apply. Uh, but Sharon does have the website, uh, the link over there and how to apply for that. Uh, the next question, can you elaborate on selling beef shares? Did I understand earlier that you can sell a quarter to a group of people instead of just an individual? You can go that route. Um, now, again, we get in the whole inspection custom thing. Um, beef shares is a phrase we we started hearing about 10 years ago with people, again, the only freezer space they have is what's ever above their refrigerator. And I can tell you right now, there's no way mine's going to hold uh, 400 pounds. And so that's where if you want to do it from a live animal standpoint, you could treat that beef animal like you would a racehorse. And we said, we mean like a racehorse. You ever notice that the guy that wins the Kentucky Derby and when they go into victory lane, hell, he's got like 15 different owners, that horse does. You can go the same route with that on the, uh, the live animal as well. If you're going the inspected freezer beef route, all right, somebody contacts you say, you know, or I've even seen this on people's website. 
the product is inspected, but they're selling quarters, halves, and holes. And if somebody calls you up and says, you know, hey, I, I can't, I don't have the freezer space for half, but I'm interested. Maybe you've got another person like that. And so, or maybe you got friends to go together. Like out here where I live, I live just north of Richmond. I've got neighbors on either side of me. I may go over to my, you know, Bill and Deb over here and, and Chris and Natasha on the other side and say, hey, how about the three of us go together and we buy a beef ham, you know, or something like that. That's what we're talking about a beef share. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think that clears it up. Um, next question on here, can, <clears throat> can you elaborate more on the path the state is going on towards getting more processors, specifically USDA inspected slaughterhouses? Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, we have a, and we actually met this morning, that was my two and a half hour meeting this morning. Um, it's the Meat Processing Expansion Committee, and I think total about $4 million has been thrown out there. And what that does is it allows meat processors to apply for grants uh, to help them purchase technology to increase processing. So for example, this summer, I would go around to some of our processors that are we're looking to get to apply for these grants and go in there and say, okay, let's look at what you've got going on here. All right, looks like you've got packaging as a bottleneck. What packaging technology can we invest in? Maybe packaging ground beef as a bottleneck. Which, what technology can we purchase to help that? Um, other things might be, well, you know, I could do more, but I don't have enough cooler space. So we've got a couple out there that are expanding their cooler space. I'll tell you the same thing I told the committee when I was out there working with some of them. Not only did I look at what they need to do to expand processing, I also looked at what they needed to fix to keep on processing because of that humane handling. There's a couple that desperate couple processors out there that desperately needed to renovate their animal handling facilities. Okay, those are the existing processors. Those and they they targeted USDA folks on that. Then there's the, those that are interested in opening up their own processing facility. And it's kind of gone, a, it's, it's gone around, down, down this route with KCARD, which can, KCARD stands for Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development. KCARD and myself, we're getting, it's calmed down a little bit now, but during the, the highlight of this pandemic, we were getting between five and 10 phone calls a week of people wanting to open up their own processing facility. And they would call me up or they would call KCARD up. And the very first question we would ask them is, do you have any experience in processing animals? And the best we would get sometimes would be, I cut up my own deer. Okay, all right, that's a starting place. A lot of times we hear the phrase, uh, I'll hire somebody. Those people are not easy to find. I, I joke, you'd have an easier time of running out in the woods and finding Bigfoot than finding that person. And so of those phone calls that I get and what KCAR gets, once we start talking to them, and it, it's funny because people say, well, it sounds like you're trying to talk me out of it. I'm not trying to talk you out of it. I'm just putting the cards on the table. I never tell anybody if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Okay, that's that's not my job in extension. That's not Michelle or Don or anybody else's job in extension to tell you good idea or bad idea. Our job is just to tell you the facts and you know lay the cards on the table. Of those, probably 95% of them say it's not for me. Others are going through that. There's Three that I can think of off the top of my head that are going in. Uh, sadly, not around here. Uh, not around, I say around here as if I'm standing in Northern Kentucky. Uh, one buying a, a place that caught on fire out in Owensboro, that's being renovated. Uh, one going down in more of the, uh, the Logan County area and one going straight south of me in that kind of Cumberland County area there. Um, those, again, those are facilities that have applied for grants and been granted that. But even at that, you know, you're still talking about like the, the one that's actually being built as we speak 
probably not going to be up and running for another year. So it takes a little bit of time to grow the or to build these things. I, I, I hope that helps you out. I mean, it's not a quick fix. We're help, we're hoping that the, the existing ones has been a little bit quicker fix. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I I'm thinking we've increased processing about twelve thousand head or what they call uh, beef units. So one a beef unit is one animal. Two pigs equal one beef unit. And I think we had four sheep or three sheep is one beef unit. And then I think we came down with like 25 chickens as one beef unit. So we've increased processing about 12,000 a month on that with what we're doing. And we're, we're continuing to do that. So I see one down here, Michelle, oh, I went off there. Go ahead, Michelle, you probably have, I saw one on the chat box I tried to catch before it rotated off. Oh, you're good. You're good. I would say you're welcome to go down the list there too, if you'd like. Um, I just like to read the question, make sure it makes it on the yep. recording. Uh, next one on here is, um, can I sell live and haul animal to processor for the customer? If yeah. so, what is required for the processor? USDA inspected needed uh, or does it need a custom processor? Again, if they own the live animal, you can be nice enough to haul it to there. All right, and that gives you either go with a custom processor or a USDA inspected processor. All right, and that's all you got. To, you're just being a nice guy and hauling it in there. All right, but if they're going the custom route, they own the live animal and they cannot sell it unless it's been inspected. All right, that's them as the owner. Okay, so this one kind of goes in line with that too. If you are selling by live weights and including processing in that price, is that legal using a custom processor? If you're doing that, um, you're starting to skate the edge there. I would rather you just sell them the live animal and let the, the new owner of that live animal pay for the processing costs. That way it's a little bit cleaner. They own the live animal on paper. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, next one to sell the retail cuts of meat as either grass fed or grass grain fed hybrid. Do you have to have an approved label? Um, like I said earlier, um, it depends. Uh, we used to have a definition for a grass finished beef, but that went into moratorium because the USDA realized it couldn't monitor that kind of stuff. If you're doing like a farmer's market, um, chances are you could probably get by with just explaining the process, all right? So you can say things like, hey, you know, we, we raise these guys on pasture, we give them some grain every once in a while, and you can go by with a generic label. Because if you're doing farmer's market, you're still more one-on-one. -on -one. If you start to get into things like a expanding into a grocery store or something like that. I, you just heard me say it's very difficult to get into grocery stores. If you start going down that internet sales and so on and so forth, you're probably looking at having to get that approved. Okay. Um, Labeling is a very convoluted thing. And I realize I'm probably being pretty confusing on that because there's, there's so many if, ands, and buts with that. Well, like you said earlier, I think KCARD is a great resource to kind of go through to see if you, you know, if you need to by looking at your business plan and where you're planning on marketing your product at. Yeah, exactly. And, and I can tell you, I, I just picked this, my, my monster can up. Okay. <laughs> um, and the reason why I pick it up is I remember attending a lecture one time there it says, I don't know if it came in there, there it says energy drink. I don't know if you can see that on there. I can barely see it on my screen. It says energy drink. That had to be on there on the label for a specific reason. I forget why, but all that stuff on there had to be approved. And so what it was, it had they they could get by of calling it an energy drink versus something else. So so and I, I throw that in there, probably confuse you even more just to show you how convoluted things can get. So yeah. Well, and, you know, like you said, and we always stress this too, if you have questions or if you need more information for things, that's what we're here for. We're happy to yes. do homework and research on it for you. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. One thing next. Talk about is this back part is the uh, nutrition label. <laughs> so <laughs> it's even more convoluted. So. <laughs> 
that's a whole nother can of worms there. Oh, yeah, that is that is a, that is a whole can you don't want to get into. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the next question, did I understand you to say that if you sell by hot carcass weight that you have to be USDA inspected? It's probably a good idea to do that. Makes it a lot more clean. Okay. Yep. Um, I think this is, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different question. Uh, so for example, if I sell a live animal to 10 people and I haul the animal to my custom processor, he says whose name goes on it. Do I have to put all 10 names on the sheet or can I put it in my name? go back and pick up the meat and deliver it to the group and they pay me back for processing. I would not do that. Uh, just be cleaner that they own the live animal. You could have a representative. Like I gave my example, my neighbors, you know, instead of putting all six of our names on there, they just say, you know, Hey, this is Greg Renfro's animal. And then we divvy it up when I get back to my house, so to speak, I would not, just you're again you're skating on that edge once again if you say i'm gonna pick it up and deliver it and then they have to pay me back that kind of stuff because now all of a sudden you're starting to look like you're selling it so to speak yeah. it's just easier if you sell it, the live animal to 10 people somebody out of that 10 is the representative owner just like the racehorse Yeah, that's all the questions in the chat box there. And I guess to kind of uh, dovetail off of that too, the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association has a list of USDA inspected processors, I believe, so do I. on their <laughs> website. Huh? So do I. <laughs> you do too. Okay. So um, if anybody wants that. Well. So there's, there's those lists that are out there. If anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, just go to the bottom of the screen. You should have the option to mute or unmute. Or go ahead and type in the chat box. Yes, this is Robert Siddons. Uh, would Alcacid be considered a hormone? What's that? Would Alcacid be considered a hormone? Not familiar with that. Can somebody help me out? It's fly control and mineral. No. It's stuff to put the mineral to kind of control the horn flies. No, I'm talking about, you know, implants like Trimbalone or uh, Revlar or something like that. Okay. I was just talking about, you know, for labeling purposes. Yeah. It, basically, if you're not giving a an implant, then you just say not giving a growth promoting. How's that? Okay. I've seen that a lot too. Not giving a growth promoting or not giving... Uh, it's not fed hormones or not given hormones, something along those lines. You did such a good job. There's no more questions, Dr. I Ray. guess not. Well, it's <laughs> nine o'clock. Everybody's ready to go to bed. You know, you get, <laughs> probably somebody young like you, Michelle, can stay up past nine o'clock with this, this old people. Oh, man. <laughs> start wanting to see the inside of our eyelids. I'm bringing the youth out and you all, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm old enough now. I'm starting to think about a midlife crisis. <laughs> we got comments a, coming in already. Great job as always. Yeah. I Looks have like a question. lit up there. We've got somebody wanting a question there, Laura. Yep. Okay, so if I haul the... If I haul the beef back home and then they buy it even though they've like bought like half of a steer or whatever from me, but I'm just being nice because it's the processor's like an hour away and I'm bringing it back to my, my house. Then that would be a um, selling off the farm situation. Again, that's that. a, I, I think I'm understanding what you're saying is you sold them the live animal. Yes. And they paid for processing costs, right? they well yes they would will be yes they will be okay they paid the processing cost just because you're nice enough to take it there maybe hey i'm dropping off another one i'll pick it up for you that's you know that's just being that's just being christian how's that sound but i'm gonna physically pay for it and they're gonna pay me back like you is this you know it's they're older they're old people that, <laughs> they're <that>. older <laughs> 
Well, yeah, and I understand what you're getting at. Um, and uh, you got to realize there's things that I'm, I have to say because I represent the University of Kentucky right. versus things that actually happen. All right. So it, it would be cleaner that if they paid for everything and they're not paying you back. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So stop being nice. Now, one option would be to simply, if, they've, if they'll trust you to, to sign a check and then you basically have a receipt yeah. and uh, the check for that uh, processing is paid by them. You can still do the nice thing and support them, but in reality, they are paying for that processing and kill fee, et cetera. That gotcha. would be okay. Yeah, yeah. That would be easier too, okay. Yeah, you, you know, again, you know, Michelle, Don and I, and all of us extension people, we were representative of UK, so we have to kind of go by the line. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, the difference between the custom and the USDA approved isn't mm -hmm. the custom processor still has to have the beef inspected by USDA inspector? Nope. Uh, custom processors, um, they don't have HACCP plans. They don't have inspectors there. Basically, it's a, a quote unquote contract between you, the farmer, and then the meat processor that they are processing that animal for you everything on that carcass and all those packages will get stamped not for sale gotcha. and your family's consumption okay right, now do you. they still get visited by the health department and usda from time to time absolutely they'll, they'll do just you know and so on and so forth that's why every once in a while in the summer i'll get a phone call from somebody who says they went to a farmer's market and they bought it meat and it said the stamp not for sale and they want to know what that means i know exactly what that means that means it wasn't inspected it means so that legally couldn't be sold at the farmer's market then correct that is illegal okay that is right. illegal Thank you. and then they then they freak out and think they're going to die so no <laughs> you're probably okay no. Okay, there's a question in the chat box here. Sure. Uh, what inspections are necessary at the farm to sell from the farm? It's my understanding USDA must inspect the freezers as well. Anything else? Um, yeah, that's probably more of a health department thing. If you're not if you're not opening up the package, you're just getting the package of meat from the process, and you're not opening it and doing anything. You're just selling it from your farm. That's more of a health department thing. And if you're selling it frozen, it has to stay frozen. Chances are the health department is going to require you to have a HACCP plan. Okay, that's what they've been doing now because of uh, uh, the new food code. So you, I would encourage you, if you're going to have everything inspected at the meat processor, that inspection le le legend is on that label, and you're going to sell from your farm, all right? Call the health department up, tell the health department what you're going to do and ask them, what do I need? If they, if you, they say, how are you going to sell it? And you say, I'm going to sell it frozen. They are going to want it to be frozen. Chances are they weren't going to want it to have its own freezer, meaning that all the product that you sell comes out of this freezer. There's no pudding pops in there. There's no pizzas. There's no lean cuisines, no TV dinner. That is solely the retail sales freezer. 